Hey everyone, uh, we're gonna do sedation and analgesia today because I got a request online for that. But I wanna start first uh, with doing a little bit of gratitude. So I have MB is gonna be my learner today. MB, what are you grateful for today? Today I'm grateful for the Walter Reed team and just the teamwork that I've seen. Yeah, me too. So the biggest thing I'm really grateful for that I wanna make a point of is number one, my colleagues all over, um, the colleagues that are about to graduate, the colleagues that I've been working with for years. We have amazing teams. Um, working all over. And I'm also really grateful for the people that are watching these videos um, to help us care for our loved ones, our family members, everyone out there who's suffering with this. Um, I'm also grateful for sedation and analgesia. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. All right, so the first thing I wanna start with is whenever we have someone on pain medication or sedation medication in the intensive care unit, we wanna use a goal to titrate that medication to. So what we usually use here is called a RAS, Richmond Agitation and Sedation Scale. Um, it starts at zero. Zero is like hanging out, chilling, normal, just you and me hanging out, almost about to fall asleep, just chilling in our lives normally. Negative one is like a little bit drowsy. And then if we get to negative five, negative five is like you're out cold. You can't function, nothing. Not even like, can't even arouse you if I try, okay? The other side of this goes all the way up to positive four, and this is like swinging at you, this like pissed off guy, okay? In general, when you look at protocols for sedation, they generally talk about people being like negative one to negative two. I really like to keep my people right here. We really wanna focus on light sedation as much as possible for patients. So hanging out, being comfortable. We don't want people in pain, right? So a little bit drowsy is fine, maybe slightly lower than that, but that's a pretty good range to try to keep them in. Okay, so that's sort of starting point number one. Use a scale, doesn't have to be the RAS. This is what we use, I'm comfortable with it. There are other ones out there. Pick one, use it. Have all of your nurses, all of your doctors, everybody being aware of what the goal is and keeping you there. Okay, all right. So then I wanna talk about both my sedatives and my analgesics, analgesics, analgesics. And I want to keep them a little bit separate in your mind up front, okay? What do you think of when you think of some medicines that we use to control pain? Uh, I think it's fentanyl. Okay, great. So fentanyl's a great one. What about if you have pain at home? What do you use? Tylenol. Ah, perfect. So Tylenol, paracetamol if you're um, across the pond, uh, but Tylenol is a great medication to always think of starting with for pain um, in general. Sometimes I take NSAIDs at home for pain. In general, in the intensive care environment, we don't like using that anyway. And now we have some questions about whether that might make outcomes worse um, in COVID specifically. So maybe avoid the NSAIDs, but Tylenol is a pretty safe one to go with. Okay, fentanyl, you know any others? Uh, morphine. Perfect. And then I'm gonna add ketamine. And then I'll put Dilaudid or hydromorphone, it's also called down there. I really almost never use this in an intensive care unit unless I have someone who's on like a, a patient controlled analgesia pump, a PCA pump, uh, then sometimes I use that. I often stick with the other ones. So uh, we'll talk some more about these uh, in just a second, I wanna go over what our sedatives are. So now we're talking about medicines that make you sleepy, make you dissociate, make you a little bit out of it, things along those lines, as opposed to things that directly control the pain. Do you know any of those? Uh, propofol. Okay, great, propofol. Okay, some other ones that we think of in the ICU are Presidex, now we think a little bit more about ketamine, so it falls in this as well. And then we think about our benzos. So benzodiazepines. So um, what I would tell you before of what my one regimen, like what I would do for all of my, my sort of my algorithm, what I would do for all of my patients in the ICU is a little bit different now in this age of COVID than it was before for a couple of reasons. But I wanna teach you what I would have done before and what I have in the back of my mind now. Okay, so if I was gonna tell you before, 
I would have told you that pick one of these two as your primary agent. Propofol is a hypnotic. The doses for that are anywhere between five and 50 micrograms per kg, I think it's per minute. Sorry if it's slightly different than that, I think it's mics per kg per minute. And then Presidex, which is somewhere between 0.2 and 1.2, I think that's mics per kg per minute. Um, either of these is fine. So Propofol is just a non-benzo hypnotic. Presidex is a centrally acting alpha-2 agonist. So it's a little bit different. Um, and I would choose one of those. And then I would have added on fentanyl as my pain medicine. And my fentanyl dose would be somewhere between 25 and 100 micrograms per hour. The reason that this would have been what I would have done is we know there are studies um, head to head with propofol and with Presidex against benzodiazepines, and there's no benefit to benzodiazepines over those, and there is more risk of delirium and other <clears throat> adverse consequences. So we put benzos lower on our list before. We tried to avoid them if we could. I um, often went with propofol first, and the reason for that is sometimes I had difficulty getting people comfortable and controlled on Presidex alone. So that was sort of the reason I would choose propofol first, but if there was someone who was easy to sedate, no problems, I would choose Presidex. Okay. Some things I want you to know about those three medicines. So propofol, side effects. Do you know any? Uh, can you, you can still get delirium with yeah. propofol, but... I don't know any specific. Okay, specific. so the big things we worry about here is that you can get low blood pressure with propofol, um, really low blood pressure. It drops your blood pressure a lot. And then the other downside of this is something called propofol infusion syndrome, which makes you get a really severe metabolic acidosis that can cause problems. Um, to be honest with you, I have used a lot of propofol and I've never actually seen in real life propofol infusion syndrome, but we talk about it a lot as being a concerning problem. Something else that happens with propofol is your pee gets green, that's okay. It doesn't mean you're getting propofol infusion syndrome, it just happens, so deal with it, okay? Not a problem. Um, one other thing to know about propofol is that it's um, in a lipid carrier, so you can get high triglycerides from it. Uh, it has to be refrigerated, uh, you have to make sure that the line doesn't get infected, all sorts of things like that go along with propofol, so have that in the back of your mind. Um, Presidex or dexmedetomidine, I try to always use generic names, but I, I always spell this one wrong. So <laughs> dexmedetomidine is the generic name, Presidex, some people just call it dex. Downsides here is that this can cause actually both hypotension and hypertension, depending on the scenario. But the thing that I've seen that's been really scary for me is they get bradycardic. And I've actually seen someone go asystolic from it. So if I have someone who has a heart rate in a 50, 60 range, I'm not gonna reach for the precedence. Okay. But in general, before either of these, with fentanyl on top of it, I would've been happy as a clam. I wouldn't bother talking to you too much about ketamine or benzos or any of the other pain meds other than Tylenol is sort of our standing for everybody. Okay, so that's pre-COVID, okay? Now, if I'm talking COVID, it's a little different and there's some reasons it's different. And so I'm not telling you what regimen to use or not use. I want you to have a lot of things in your back pocket as options, okay? As we start running out of supplies, we might run out of meds. We may not have access to Presidex or Propofol. We may not have access to fentanyl, so I want you to know others. We may not have enough IV pumps, so you're gonna have to figure out a drug that you can just give in bolus dosing. You can't really do that with these, okay? You can do that with fentanyl, just keep that in mind. But you wanna think about things that maybe would be more long acting that you can just keep in your back pocket, go in and give it as needed. And we also wanna think about medicines that might allow us to stay out of the room as much as possible. So all those things swirling around your mind make me wanna teach you about some of these other ones. So ketamine is an um, NMDA receptor antagonist it causes dissociative state, so it sort of has some pain function and some sedative function. The dose range um, is somewhere in the area of 0.5 to 4 
minutes per keg. Thing. I'm not sure if it's minute or hour, something, in some time, I'm gonna say per time. Sorry about that. Um, it's a great option with less effect on blood pressure than some of the other medicines have. Uh, it can cause a lot of hypersalivation that you wanna think about. Um, it can cause laryngospasm. So there are some downsides to this, but in general, it's a great med that just sort of makes people chill out. It can also cause um, tachycardia and hallucinations. So sometimes we give it in conjunction with benzos for people if they're getting hallucinations with it, okay? So another option in your back pocket. Benzos. So when we talk about benzos, there's sort of three big ones that I think about. There's many others, but I think of midazolam, lorazepam, and diazepam. And I write them in this order because this is the order of half-life. So the half-life here is like two to six hours. The half-life here is like 10 to 20 hours. And then the half-life here, I don't know exactly, but I'm gonna say like 40 to 80 hours, something really long, okay? So if we can only give a patient one medicine and then we're not gonna have time to go back and see them for a long time, this may be a good medicine to help keep them calm, right? Or uh, Ativan can be a good medicine to do that too. The midazolam is gonna wear off more rapidly. So we think about the midazolam as being more of a drip medicine that we have someone on like a milligram an hour or two milligrams an hour as a drip. We don't use lorazepam as a drip. The reason we don't do that is it's carried in, uh, in a carrier that causes a metabolic acidosis. And so we don't want that carrier to build up. It's not the drug itself that's the problem, it's the carrier, okay? Um, so other options that you want, before I would have said, the risk of delirium is too high, too many problems with it, don't use benzos. Think about having the option of using benzos now, okay? And then as far as the meds go, same sort of issue. So fentanyl is gonna have a shorter half-life than morphine. So you wanna keep in mind having that morphine accessible to use as needed. Um, I'm always a little bit hesitant to give um, what the correct dose range of morphine is because there's such huge levels um, of what affects people and what people's tolerance is and all of that. Um, but in general, if I'm gonna put someone on a drip, I, I try to start it at like 0.5 milligrams an hour, one milligram an hour and titrate to as much as needed, okay? Um, we already talked a little about a Dilaudid. I don't use that too much, um, but it's something else to keep in the back of your mind. And then we talked about sort of the, the ketamine sort of falls into both of these categories. Okay, um, the things I want you to think about, one more important point is if you have your patient paralyzed because they have respiratory failure and you're trying to minimize their oxygen consumption or trying to get them to be compliant with the ventilator, whatever the case may be, if you have someone paralyzed, you must also have them sedated. Okay, so please, please, please make sure you have them on a sedative and an analgesic if they're paralyzed. Because otherwise, they could really be suffering and not be able to tell you in any way, shape, or form. Okay, that's a big one that's really important to me. Okay, um, so I think now you have a plan in your back pocket. You're gonna use a, a scoring system to decide how much sedation someone needs. You're gonna keep that RAS, zero, negative one range, maybe negative two, or some other scale. Use a scale, make sure everyone's on the same sheet of music with it. If you have lots of supplies, everything's cool, standard ICU patient, pick one of these two. Tack on fentanyl if they need something for pain, okay? Uh, if not, then use what you can use from our list. Keep in mind that all of these things are completely reasonable options in the age of COVID, okay? And B, are there any questions I can answer for you? Don't wanna throw you off, but where does Verse said? Ah, Ball. midazolam is Versed. Is Versed. Okay. Yep. Great okay. question. Perfect. Yep. So Versed, Ativan, Valium okay. are those three generic uh, trade names. Okay. I'm tracking now then. Okay. Good. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks for your time today. I hope you learned something. Go out and take good care of patients. Have a good one.